Who would like to go first? Do, do. Did someone raise their hand? Oh. Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, Teresa. You're muted. Oh, yeah, you're muted. But we all do speak, but, but you're, we all do read You're this. going strong, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we had a fabulastic um, group and uh, Rachel's gonna come on here and speak well in just a few minutes. I uh, like that's W-H-A-L-E, not well, W-E-L-L. -L. But um, so I'll let her take that one. But um, one of the things that spoke to me is, you know, when the, when the host came and he said, you know, there's a, there's a place for you um, that when he, let me read that. Let me just read it. Um, when it says the host will say to you, my friend, come and sit, come and sit right up here. Well, there's an RSVP for every one of us. The table of the Lord has been spread. When I think about that, I think of strawberries and bread and whatever the, the food is that you like, just the best. But we all, the whole world has an RSVP, as I stated, whether, whether you know it or not, whether you're following, whether you're gazing or not, your chair is still there. You still make up the whole of the body of Christ. So your chair is still there. And then I think of in 18 when it says, I think it's 21, that says there's room for more. That just stuck with me. There's room for more. There's always room for more. And then thinking about that and thinking when the people rejected or when the people didn't want to come, you know, we all came out of religious, most of us. And when the people didn't want to come, he said, well, go out into the, the nook and crannies, go out into the valleys, go out where the homeless go, just go search everybody and let them know they're awesome and they're loved and draw them back in. Well, I compare that to King David, Jonathan and Mephibosheth. King David being God, uh, meaning again, K K uh, the king and then Jonathan meaning the gift of God. And Meshibafeth, Meshibafeth, meaning lame or without a pasture, coming from Lodabar without a shepherd. So the story goes just on a high level that at age five, that, that Meshibafeth was, he lost his father, he lost his grandfather, and he became lame. So David and, and Jonathan had made a pact, an agreement. And uh, he asked, um, I'm sorry, getting tongue tied, trying to get too much out. Jonathan said, you know, make, remember me. I'm doing this for you, to, re but remember me. So he came out and he said, is there somebody that I may show them for Jonathan's sake that I can reach out? Is there anyone? They said, yes, there's Mephibosheth. He is lame. He has been dropped. And I liken that to how many of us have felt dropped. How many of us have felt insignificant? How many of us felt like we haven't mattered? But yeah. they, they pick him up and say, well, bring him to my table. And he said, forever, you'll eat at the table of the king. Forever, you'll have the brick. Forever, you'll be in. And I, I thought that was so neat that I in my life have felt bad, uh, dropped. And I'm like, God, who will, invest, who will invest in me? And the Lord said, I've invested in you. And if you feel dropped, know that you're invited to the table. Know that there's always a resting place where you're always fed, sitting at the table, regardless. The king is looking for you and waiting at the table. Amen. That's it for me. Hey, and and no, Teresa, we're not giving you an offering. <laughs> hey. <laughs> okay, Jim. Good job. Yeah, I enjoyed that. That is awesome. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, verse 35 of uh, the, the last uh, and the sentence, soak your hearing in thoughts that bring flavor to every conversation. That's amazing because, because 
you know, a man as a man thinks, Jesus said, in his heart, so is he. And what Pat Patrick tries and and does for everyone in the mirror uh, Bible study is to say this after me, soak your thoughts. Soak your hearing in thoughts. So you hear the word or you read the word and th that creates thoughts that bring flavor. The flavor of what? Flavor of heaven. You know, uh, the, you know, I heard your word and it's like sweet honey to my lips or to my mouth. And soaking the hearing your hearing is a choice that can bring and will bring flavor to every conversation. That's something I can't do, but I can soak my thoughts in reading the mirror word, um, listening to my brothers and sisters on this uh, Bible study, and listening to their thoughts so that it it gives me the flavor of heaven from their conversation to to me and then from me to someone else it's really simple but yet profound very good timothy next you could even go like janet this. Where's Janet? You're waving your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean she's doing it? Talk to the, the minute that I, the minute that I start talking, my dogs start barking. So, <laughs> but they haven't yet. That's a miracle right there. But we were, I was in a wonderful group with Alan and um, Melissa and, but, Trisha, and I had, I think I said all the names right. I'd never been in that group, and it was tailor-made for us that night. It felt like we were feasting, That just what Tim was talking about. It felt like we just had a full meal deal, like the banquet of heaven, like was so flavorful. Everybody just shared from their heart about the reality of this, you know, this feast right now that we're celebrating and you know it's not one day high in the sky high you know it, it's not a feast later it is now it's the it's communion now it's it's not a tradition it's not a ritual it is relationship and fellowship and communion and it's so flavorful it's so it remind me of like a barbecue ribs you know like <laughs> <laughs> your hands get all sticky and yummy and everything tastes so good and you just can't get enough of it. And that's what it, it was like the best barbecue that we had. And I just enjoyed how the Lord is speaking to our hearts where at one time, these parables seemed to be so religiously presented to me. Like it just felt like you cannot come. You have, you know, you, you're out, you know, but I'm going to go to the blind and the lame and the, you know, but yet, now that we see it through the eyes of grace, through the eyes of Jesus and his unconditional love, it is the best. The parables just come alive to me. They come alive in a way that it is all inclusive. Everybody is gets to feast right now. And it's really your choices of going, no, I think I can do it. I think I can build this. I can do this by myself. I can, you know. You know, no, you just come to the conclusion like, I'm going to make a peace agreement with Jesus. I'm going to settle into this rest, this finished work, and I'm going to have the look at this bountiful feast right in front of me. It's wonderful. <laughs> and it's all you guys, this enjoyous, yummy, delicious, delectable fellowship that we have. <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> Great job, Janet. Okay, beautiful Joan. Hey, Joan. Hey, 
You're muted, Joan. Fun. And I said, I'm going to be an echo of what Janet from that same um, leaning. Um, in verse 15, when it says, how blessed is anyone who eats of this heavenly bread in God's kingdom. And where the Lord took me was back in Luke when he said, I long for this. That he wanted, he would not, part, he was not going to eat until he came into the kingdom. And there was a longing in the heart of Jesus for this union. For us to come into this and we realize that we are in the kingdom. We are part, we are eating and feasting on each other. As the body of Christ, he gets to eat his body. As his, I get to feast on him. And it's that, it's, it's the union that we've come into, into the absolute kingdom of God. That it's not futuristic. We're not waiting. But the feast is there. It's a banquet. And the table has been set. Someone once said that the cross has become a table. And that it's a gathering place where we get to feast at this table. Mm. So good. So good, Joan. Next. That was great, Joan. That was Thank awesome. You. Did someone say Rachel was? Oh, there, yeah. beautiful Aaron. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, I was just, I didn't share this in our group, but I was just thinking, um, you know, I know he came, you know, for the Jews, but, you know, God always had the outcasts and the lonely and the, you rejected ones in mind. He always had us, you know, us as all of us in mind. And, you know, like I was just thinking about how when I was reading a long time ago, I was reading the Bible chronologically. And I remember going through the stories and I noticed that the very first time that an angel of the Lord appeared surprised me because it was to Hagar of all people. It was to Hagar and I remember God speaking so clear, clearly to me through that and saying, I always, you know, I always had the rejected ones in mind. I always had the ones that were overlooked in mind. And um, and I, I I could be wrong in this, but I believe that he showed up in his uh, the name that he gave the very first name, you know, that um, that mankind, you know, ever heard from God was. Uh, Jehovah, was it Jehovah Shema? I believe it was the God who sees. Maybe I'm, I think, I think that's correct. But I remember that the translation was the God who sees. And he sees us like even when we're in that lonely place or that feels like an isolated place where we've been rejected. He's the one that sees us. And that's how he first introduces himself through the very first angel of the Lord that shows up, you know, in, in the course of history. So I just found that super profound, you know, and, you know, and then reading it here tonight, reading about the blind and the crippled and going to those people, it's like it, you know, when I used to read that, I thought, uh, you know, from a religious lens, I'm like, oh, that's more like an afterthought, like they were the afterthought because the other people rejected him. And now like all along, you know, he had all of us in mind, right? And you know, it might seem like he came just for a certain people group, but he he always had all of us in mind. And he and now he, he still has room for more. And I just think that's so beautiful how the gospel really, to me, the heart of the gospel is the inclusiveness, you know, of of including all of us in that plan. So I think that's beautiful. That is awesome. Thank you. Aaron. that was awesome. All the comments are awesome. Anybody else would like to share some good wisdom? Hey, Carl, how about sharing a little bit about the first couple of verses? That was really good. Yeah, um, I was telling my group that what I found interesting, in the first um, few verses of Luke 14, um, they invited Jesus to a meal. And it's quite obvious that they were trying to lay a trap because at this 
invited meal was also a man with severe swollen joints. So they would have had to invite the man as well <laughs> um, to come to the dinner, the lunch or whatever it was, the meal. And they put him right in front of Jesus, sitting on right in front of Jesus, where it's like, you can't miss the guy. <laughs> you know, you can't miss the guy. And they, they basically, you know, with testing Jesus to see exactly, you know, if he, if he would heal, if he would heal someone on the Sabbath. And Jesus poses the question to them in verse three, and they did not realize that, I don't think they realized that here is the son of God, man of grace and compassion. And you have a life in front of you who's in pain and discomfort and sick and whatever. And God isn't going to turn his back and walk away. It's like, mm. So Jesus asked the question and they made a mistake by remaining silent. <laughs> so Jesus takes hold of the man, heals him and set him free. And then poses a question back to them again. Another question. And they knew, they would have to knew, know that if their son or their ox fell into a pit, they would pull them out. So, but yet, verse 6 says they had nothing to say to refute his logic. So they could not present an argument before he healed the man, they could not pre prevent an argument after they healed the man. They were dumbfounded. And one of the things that came to my mind was you had this, this is a situation where law met grace. And in a situation like that, law is not going to win. It's not going to um, have the preeminence and the rule. You know, because grace and truth is going to dispel whatever law-based performance, mindset, value system, whatever it is, is going to, as I say, crash and burn, right? And this was just one of the, one of the things that stood out to me very early in, in, the, in the chapter that, um, they certainly did not know what they were getting into. They thought they knew. They thought they would have been able to lay a trap for Jesus and entrap him. But it was a no-win situation for them. That was, that's what stood out for me. That's awesome. Awesome, Carl. That's excellent. Anyone else? Okay. Getting to the end here. Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? Bueller? 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 <laughs> okay. Should I close her down? I guess we're done. We'll close it down. Next week, we're going to be on the beach with Rachel. She's going to be like banning us.